you don't know um, Mr. Chris or uh, Mr. Mike or Mr. Danny, you've never met Ben or Brian, but in a way, you kind of have because you've met me. And these are just a few of the men who, as I was coming into maturity, took time out of their lives to invest in me. Uh, through Sunday school relationships, mentoring relationships, discipleship relationships, they, they took the faith that they had and they invested it in me. And I think you would find, if you were to observe their lives today, you would see some of the traits in them that you see in me. Because you have met at least parts of them, the parts of them that live on in me. Because I'm the man I am today because of them. And you can't tell the story of my faith journey with Jesus without mentioning their names. Because they, they took seriously their commitment to be for the next generation. They took seriously their commitment to invest in someone who was behind them. And their testimony to what it looks like when a church takes seriously its call to be for families. My name is Jake Davis, and I'm the creative and digital pastor here at Mountaintop. And I promise you, I would not be standing on the stage if it wasn't for men like Mr. Mike and Mr. Danny and Mr. Chris and Ben and Brian. I'm indebted to them. And uh, if you're new here, we're, we're in the middle of a series called uh, Holy Burden 4. And today we're talking about this concept of being four families. And if you are new, I'd love to um, invite you after the service, um, if you haven't already, to, to go out here to the New Here booth and get connected. And you can learn more about exactly what we mean when we say this. But today we're going to continue the series by talking about being four families. And we're going to look at a passage in Scripture um, in 2 Timothy. But before we get there... I want to talk to you about why. We are uh, just a few weeks away, honestly, from opening a new kids' wing. We're adding 16,000 square feet for families. And I think it's important before we open it for us to ask that question. Why did we build it? Because I think if we don't understand the why, then we will struggle to grasp exactly how to use it. And so I think it's important for us to understand that it, it's just a building. It's just cement. It's just brick and mortar and paint and steel. But in order for it to become more than that, in order for it to become a tool that can function for achieving our mission, we have to understand the why behind it. And this is the why. Four families. Because we believe that one more changed family can shape a generation. We honestly believe that the work that we're going to do together in that building over the next decade and beyond is going to make a difference here in Birmingham for the next generation. We believe that kids are going to come to know Jesus there. We believe that families are going to be invited in. And we're trying to make space for you to invite them so that one more family can know what it's like to be invited into our family here at Mountaintop and by extension can know what it's like to be a part of the family of God. One more changed family can, can shape a generation. But it's also a strategic decision that we've made based on our specific context. We live in Vestavia Hills. We're planted in Vestavia Hills, right? Uh, we are around su suburbs. And, and here's some statistics. Okay, we did some research. We, why are we four families? Because there's 100,000 people within a five-mile radius of Mountaintop who are not actively involved in church. 100,000 people, it's just five miles of here, who have never heard the good news that God is for them, or who have walked away from church and, and need to be invited back in. And of that population, by 2025, by January, almost 31% of our community will have been born after 2002. And I'm pretty young, and that makes me feel old. We live in a young community. Even more than that, over 50% are already 40 or younger. It is clear that God has put us in a context that is about families. We have great schools, right? We're centered around the family. And so as we started looking at what is God calling us to do in Birmingham, like, why don't we try to reach families? Why don't, we, why don't we plant our flag in this concept of being for families? But it's not just a strategic decision based on our context. 
It's also based on our mission. We're four families because followers of Jesus make disciples. Our mission statement is that we invite and equip people to follow Jesus. If you follow Jesus, we like to uh, help you develop seven traits of a follower. And one of them, one of those marks, is to make disciples. Because we believe that if you follow Jesus, then it is your mandate, it is your call to turn around and to deposit that faith into someone else. To be a disciple who makes disciples, to be a follower of Jesus who makes other followers of Jesus. It's crucial to our mission. And this morning, as we look at this passage in the book of 2 Timothy, we're going to be introduced to a relationship between two guys, a man by the name of Paul and Timothy. Paul poured into Timothy. Paul was one of the early church founders. He he kind of started the modern-day Christian church in the first century, and he had a disciple named Timothy, and he wrote two letters to him, and this is the second one of those. And in it, we're going to see um, all sorts of encouragement, and instruction, but I don't think it's just for Timothy. I think it's for us too. Paul knew that uh, by investing in Timothy, he wasn't just investing in one person. He was actually investing in the future of the church. As a church, uh, we have a role to play in investing in the next generation, just like that baby. We have a, we have a role to play in investing in, in those kids. We have a role to play, just like Paul played in Timothy's life, to invest in the next generation. So today we'll explore what it means to do that through the lens of the first couple chapters of 2 Timothy. So let's turn there now. Um, If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one on the shelf as you leave today as our gift to you. We're going to be in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 this morning, starting with verse 5. Paul says to Timothy, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Paul calls Timothy's faith sincere, and this is how sincere faith is developed. It is the truths of God's word are planted into parents' and grandparents' hearts, and then they raise up their children in those truths. They, they pass them down through the generations. This is what it means to develop sincere faith. But Paul is, is clear that this type of sincere faith, it doesn't happen without a little bit of effort. Okay, listen, I've got three kids and they're all under six, okay? So I'm tired. I understand that parenting is difficult. I get it. And I understand too that this world is complicated. This world we're raising them in is, is a mess. But at Mountaintop, we don't, ha- we don't want you to have to do it alone. Every week, our kids' ministry tries to make it as easy as possible for you to pass down biblical truths to children. They provide resources on the wall downstairs in their space. They send home activities. We even have an app available to you called Parent Q App that has all sorts of daily devotionals and ways to incorporate God's word into your family's daily routines. Because we believe that when the light of the church and the heart of the home combine to work together, we can mobilize the next generation to love and serve God. And listen, listen, we only get your kids for one hour a week, 52 Sundays a year. I can promise you this, 52 hours is not enough time to build a sincere faith. It has to happen in your home. And so we try to partner with you to give you the resources. And I really believe that if you take those resources to heart and you begin to apply those biblical truths in your home, that you'll see exactly what Paul witnessed in Timothy. You will see a sincere faith start to develop in your kids' lives and they will own it for themselves. It doesn't happen though without a little bit of work. Listen how Paul explains it in verse six. For this reason, I remind you, Timothy, to to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. We have to fan it into flame. We've been given a gift of God, but we have to fan it into flame. We have to do that for the next generation. We have to teach them to fan into flame their desire for God. And maybe if you're you're a little bit like me, then as you've grown, sometimes you go through, through seasons where your faith wanes a little bit, right? Where that flame is a little dimmer. So this morning, might I posit a solution to you? If you want to keep your faith fresh, pass it down. If you want to find that something that's missing in your walk with God, maybe taking up the mantle to be four families will rekindle your love for Jesus. Maybe the key is for you to return to your childlike love of Jesus, to remember what it was like when you were young and on fire. 
And I'm convinced that our faith grows stagnant when we don't act as a funnel, when we keep it to ourselves and don't share it with the next generation. So let me just ask you, what is stopping you from being a Paul to a Timothy, investing in the next generation? Maybe you think, I mean, that sounds great, but I'm not really qualified. I'm not the right candidate for this. But Paul says to Timothy, this, this gift of God, this, this flame of faith that is in you is because I've laid hands on you. I've, I've commissioned you through the, through the laying on of hands, right? You're like, oh, that's great. But I mean, that's Paul, right? And we've already talked about he kind of started the church. Um, and that's Timothy, like his direct disciple. I am neither of those people. I'm not a saint. You do not want me. I'm not qualified. And it is important to note that none of you planted hundreds of churches in the Mediterranean and none of you are responsible for the birth of modern-day Christianity. But that's okay. Because here at Mountaintop, you're still a minister. You've been ordained in some sort of way. God is calling you to play a role in investing in the next generation. You all have a role to play in that. So my encouragement to you this morning is just like Paul's to Timothy. Fan the flame. Get in the game. Let's go shape a generation together. And if you still have doubts, well, then listen to this encouragement from Paul. It says, for the spirit of God, uh, the, the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. We do not have a spirit of fear. We need not fear that we are not qualified, that we are incapable, that we don't know enough about the Bible. We need not fear that we aren't good with kids or that we're too old or that we can't relate to middle schoolers because they smell weird and they're difficult and we don't get their lingo. The excuses can go on and on and on. We don't have to fear those things. We have everything we need in God to reach the next generation. And we also, we don't need to fear that our world is too chaotic and that the next generation is beyond reach, that they're, 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 they're no good, we can't save them. Because we do not fear the world. God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. We have power from God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. So why would we fear any adversary to the gospel? We have love, the love of Jesus in us that motivates us and compels us to give our lives selflessly to children that we don't even know yet. We have the self-discipline of the Holy Spirit, the, the resolve that when we want to get off course pulls us back and keeps us focused on the mission ahead. We have everything we need. We need not fear. We don't have a spirit of fear. We have a spirit of power and love and of self-discipline. And even more than that, we are not ashamed. It says, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, Timothy. We're not ashamed. We are not ashamed of the gospel. That's why we're four families, because we're not ashamed of the gospel. We will not shrink away from what we know to be true. In a world that is becoming increasingly post-Christian, we will not shrink away from the gospel because we're not ashamed to wear it as a badge. And so we're gonna pass it on to the next generation because we're not ashamed of, of what it means to us. And we think it's worth it. Listen to how Paul says this in the, next, in the, in the, in the uh, back half of verse eight. He says, rather join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. We're not ashamed of it so much so that we're willing to suffer for it, to give up something for it. Why are we for families? Because we believe that the gospel is worth suffering for. We believe simply the gospel is worth it. It's worth whatever God asks of us. We don't have to fear, as Paul did, being thrown in prison for being for families. We're not at, at, at risk of much physical suffering for the gospel here in our context. However, it is worth asking a difficult question. What do our schedules reveal about how much worth we assign to the gospel in the next generation? Does the way we are investing our lives say to the world that the gospel is worth it? And, and, I, and I count it as a blessing, and I hope you do too, that uh, suffering for, for the gospel in our context is a little bit more rosy than it was in Paul's. Because maybe for you, suffering is as simple as rocking a crying baby so their parent can attend worship. Maybe it's uh, chasing around a rambunctious group of fourth grade boys. Maybe it's uh, holding a door open for a new family and welcoming them into Mountaintop 
for the first time with a warm smile. Maybe it's driving a golf cart on a Sunday morning so a single mom can sit down for the first time that morning because Lord knows she didn't sit down once trying to get those kids to church. Maybe, maybe it's just little, simple ways that you can suffer for the gospel to be for families. To pour in for one hour on a Sunday to the next generation because you've decided that the gospel is worth it. Maybe you're like, all right, Jake, I, I get it, all right? Stop with the hard sell. I'm for families. I'm in. You've sold me. How? How are we for families? Well, Paul, uh, through the rest of this letter, is going to give us a simple three-step approach to passing on our faith to the next generation. And the first step is really simple, okay? It's really easy. Just remember God's goodness to you. Just remember how good God was to you first before you ever even thought of him. Paul uh, kind of writes in the letter here uh, a, um, a diatribe here for Timothy of like, what is the gospel? And, and what is it? How, how has God been good to you? He says, God has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done. You didn't earn it. You did nothing to deserve the favor of God, but he freely gave it to you because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Did you know that before the beginning of time you were on God's mind? That he was thinking of you. That before he even created anything, he was thinking about how much he was going to love you. Before he made his plan of redemption, he was thinking about you and he was thinking about the kids that are downstairs right now learning about how much he loves them. Before the beginning of time, God was working his plan to be for you. Remember how good he's been to you. It was given to us from the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We've been saved, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is it. This is what we're all about. This is the gospel. This is, this is you were far from God, and before the beginning of time, God chose you. He loved you so much that he sent his only son to earth to die the death that you deserve because of your sin, for you to pay for your sins so you don't have to live in guilt and shame anymore. You can be free from your sin. But he didn't stay dead. He rose on the third day, defeating death so that you can have eternal life. That is good news. Amen. Just remember how good God has been to you. And that makes the second step really, really simple because it's natural. You can't help but do it. Once you remember God's goodness for you, it is impossible not to testify of God's goodness to others. To just turn around and tell people, this is how God has changed my life. This is what Jesus means to me. To, to, to actually speak those words. To people, when they notice something different about you, don't you be like, yeah, I had a good day today. No, Jesus changed my life. And let me tell you about him, because I think he'd change everything for you too. Paul says, of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. You've been appointed this morning to be a herald, an apostle, and a teacher, to testify to how God has been good to you, to a world that is hopeless, who needs to know that God is for them. Now, this third step, I have to apologize, it's a little more difficult. Once you've remembered God's goodness for you and testified to that goodness, you have to be willing to surrender to God's good plans for you. It's going to take a little bit of surrender. Listen to how Paul describes it. That is why, because of God's goodness for me, that is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed. Notice he doesn't say what I've believed. I know who I have believed. We're not just trying to get kids to recite Bible verses and cute little Christian songs. We're not just trying to get to pass down head knowledge. We're trying to introduce them to Jesus. The, the guy who changed everything for us because we believe that Jesus can change everything for them if they'll just hold fast to his truths. It's not just about what we believe, it's about who we believe in. And we suffer for that. We, we surrender to that. I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. We, we surrender our lives to God and say, however you want to use me to impact the next generation, I'm yours. So you could say it that way. You could say, remember God's goodness for you, testify to, of God's goodness to other people, and surrender your life to God's good plans. Or you could say it the way we say it at the end of every service. God is for you. We are for you. Let's be for Birmingham. 
It's not just a catchphrase. We say it at the end of every service because it's a reminder of God's goodness for you, the way that he was for you. And then as a result of that, go out into the world and live your life in a way that says to the world, we're for you. Because God's for me, I'm free to be for you. I don't have to be against you. I can be for you. And then together we can say, let's be for Birmingham. Let's surrender our lives to God's good plans for us, for our city, for families who need to hear the good news. He might be saying at this point, oh, that's great, but we're building an $8 million building. So like, what's the catch? What's in it for us? There's gotta be something in it for us, right? I think you're asking the wrong question, but I'm glad you asked it this morning because Paul's gonna answer you. Over the rest of, uh, in the next, next chapter, uh, just a little bit further in the letter, Paul gives three images. Three kind of images, uh, a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. And these three image, images that he uses to tell the story, uh, he's going to give you a role, he's going to give you a responsibility for that role, and then he's going to give you a reward. What it is that we uh, have as a reward for the work that we do. So let's look at this in chapter 2. It says, Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown, except by competing according to the rules. And the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. What is Paul talking about? An athlete, a soldier, a farmer? These are all roles that we have to play in passing our faith on to the next generation. So let's look first at the soldier. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. So here's your role, soldier, and here's your responsibility. We do not get entangled in civilian affairs. So what we can take this to mean is that if we're going to fight for the next generation, it's going to require focus. Fighting for the next generation requires us to focus. We cannot get off course. We cannot get entangled in civilian affairs. Paul describes a soldier as someone who is focused, determined, committed to the mission. We don't get distracted. We keep our eyes on our purpose. And as a church, I mean, this is where we're planting our flag. We're going to help families in our community raise children who know and love Jesus. And we can't let distractions pull us away from that mission. We're going to focus on what matters, which means we're also not going to focus on what doesn't matter. We refuse to lose ground in the battle for the next generation by fighting for things that don't matter. We just simply will not lose influence with the next generation over tertiary and secondary issues. We're not going to do it. We're going to keep the main thing the main thing here at Mountaintop. Nothing louder than the gospel. Because that's what our community needs. And the focus on this new building is our community. It's not us. We have to stay focused for the one family in Vestavia, for the one family in Hoover, for the one family in every city and suburb surrounding. We're sold out for them. And this is where you get to own the mission. I don't know the families you know. I can't invite them. We're, we're, we're making space for you to invite your friends. We're making space for you to invite the families of, uh, that are in your kids' classes, the, the kid that's in band with your child or on their ball teams and cheer squads and the ones you run into at the city center. We're for them. That's who we're building this building for. And so what's the reward? Paul says, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. We're for, we're for families because it pleases God. It pleases our commanding officer. We have a battle to fight. And our commanding officer says, it would please me if you would try to influence the next generation. And that's our reward. We get to please our God. Paul moves on to the next image. Anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. So we have the role of athlete and the responsibility here is to compete according to the rules. Competing for the next generation means having integrity. If we're going to compete with the world for the next generation, then we have to have integrity. We've got to play by the rules. But an athlete who cheats is no athlete at all, right? We must have integrity. 
This is a call for each of us in our personal lives to model integrity, to let young people see you living out your faith honestly and humbly. And let, let me say a bit here about how this influences our strategy as an organization. This is why we take safety and security in our next gen spaces on campus so seriously. There are clear parameters around who can serve in, as a small group leader for our kids and students, and we won't back down from them because we value integrity. And kids cannot thrive in their faith if they are not first safe and protected. And let's be honest, the church in America has failed at this. We've done a poor job of protecting the next generation. Scandal after scandal has made it clear the church in America is failing the next generation. Young people are leaving church in record numbers, not because they don't believe in God, but because they have had an experience in church that was incongruent with what they were taught in church. That's not acceptable. The reasons, uh, the research from groups like uh, Barna and Pew, who are church uh, research groups, is overwhelming. One of the main reasons for the next generation walking away from their faith is because of the hypocrisy and judgment that they experience inside the church walls. If we're going to compete with the world to influence the next generation, it starts here with integrity. It starts with getting it right. It starts with looking in the mirror and making sure that our lives actually reflect the gospel that we preach. And what's in it for us? Paul says, we will receive the victor's crown. If we compete with integrity, we will receive the victor's crown. If we compete with integrity, the faith of the next generation is our reward. They will see that we believe what we say. And they'll be convinced that Jesus is who he says he is. But if we don't have integrity, why would they believe what we say about Jesus? Their faith will be our reward. Paul moves on to the final image. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crop. So you have the role of farmer and the responsibility to be hardworking. Farmers are kind of known, right, for their dedication, their, their patience and willingness to get their hands dirty. Investing in the next generation means getting our hands dirty. We've got to get in there. We've got to get to know these families. We have to be willing to get involved in the lives of young people, to, to mentor them and listen to them and guide them in their faith and help them navigate a messy world. We have to help families learn how to raise their kids to follow Jesus in the midst of a confusing and complicated world. Getting our hands dirty means getting to know the families in our community, knowing what they're going through, knowing what they're struggling with, and knowing what makes them tick. And what's in it for us? Paul says the hardworking farmer is the first to receive a share of the crops. Why are we four families? We're four families because the harvest is plentiful. 100,000 people in our community don't go to church. It's, it's, the number's way higher than that in the Birmingham metro area. The harvest is plentiful. There are families who are out there right now who don't know the good news that God is for them. And they're just waiting to be invited in. As we invest in young people, we will see a generation of believers rise up full of passion and purpose for God. And investing in them means we're going to contribute to a larger harvest, a movement of faith that will impact future generations. This is the reward for our work. And make no mistake, our mission is hard work. We exist to invite and equip people to follow Jesus, to follow him. And where is he? He's out there in our community, getting his hands dirty. Scripture tells us he came to seek and to save the lost. Don't spend all of your time looking for Jesus in here. He's out there. You want to follow Jesus, get out there and take his mission seriously to seek and save the lost families right outside our walls. Our job is to equip people to follow Jesus out there in their everyday lives. We want you to give your lives for this mission to invite and equip people to follow Jesus. We don't want you to just grow deeper. We want you to grow closer to the heart of Jesus for your neighbor. We don't want you to just know more. We want to equip you to know more about the lost person that works next to you in the cubicle at work. We are trying to equip you to follow Jesus by giving your life to this mission. And I don't care how deep we go here at Mountaintop if we don't scratch the surface of expanding the kingdom of God. There's a world out there waiting for us to invite them in. So what's in it for you? The joy 
of a small child hearing the gospel for the first time. The joy of a fourth grader being baptized by their small group leader. The joy of a teenager who's far from God, who never thought any of this church stuff was for them, coming alive as they serve in God's church and find community among their peers. The joy of a family that moved to Birmingham from out of town and is having a hard time adjusting, trying to find a church, and they walk through our doors and feel like Birmingham is home for the very first time. It's the joy of a family whose child is struggling with mental health, who finds the hope of Jesus here, and whose child feels like they belong for the first time because a small group leader invested in them consistently week after week. It's, it's a marriage that's on the rocks, that gives one last ditch effort and drags their family to church, hoping something will change, and God does a transformative work in their hearts, in their home, in their marriage. Listen, that's what's in it for us. That's why we're four families. And if that wasn't enough, earlier in chapter one, this is how Paul encourages Timothy. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching. Hold fast to the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Someone deposited faith into you and now it's your job to guard it. Why are we four families? Because someone was for us first. Someone invested in us. You probably have a, a, a Mr. Danny, a Mr. Mike, a Mr. Chris, a Ben, and a Brian in your life who were influential in helping you find faith and grow in Jesus. They were for you. And now it's your job to guard the deposit that they deposited into you of faith and, and give it to the next generation to make sure that it perseveres to the next generation. I, I'm, I think of um, a woman by the name of Charlotte. Charlotte was a, a sweet older woman who uh, was in my parents' church growing up. Um, and uh, she was actually an elder on their board. And she was a CPA in her career. But by the time that I really came into maturity, she was uh, kind of done. I mean, she had retired as a CPA. All three of her crazy boys had graduated and were out of the house and had, their, had families of their own. So I mean, like, her job was done, right? She was an elder on the board. She's coasting. No. That's not the image I have of Miss Charlotte. The image I have of her is when she was at church after hours during music rehearsals, rocking babies and changing diapers. The image I have of Miss Charlotte is we used to go on mission trips all the time. And we would gather to pray before we left and then we'd get on the charter bus and head out. You better believe every time we got on that charter bus there was going to be a few pans of brownies from Miss Charlotte. Because she loved investing in the lives of students and children. She took seriously her call to be four families, to invest in the next generation in small, almost insignificant ways. I talked to my parents this week about Miss Charlotte. I said, I'm going to use her in my sermon. And I told them what I was going to talk about. She's 75. They went on two mission trips this year. Brownies. Both times. She's still doing it. Because God's not done with her. He can use you in whatever stage of life you're in to be for the next generation. So my question to you this morning is, how are you for families? How are you guarding the deposit that someone deposited into you? What are you doing to be for families? Listen, you're gonna get an opportunity after the service to go out, to, out into the atrium. There's a table there with all sorts of cards about ways that you can get involved. You can serve with kids. If that's not your thing, that's okay. We need more of everything. Our campus is growing. We're opening up more rooms. We need more security. We need more golf cart drivers. We need more help parking families to get them into the building. We need more help greeting families as they walk in. We need more help serving coffee to parents who are really tired and need a cup of coffee to get through church. <laughs> Whatever you can do, in significant ways, significant ways to make an impact in the next generation because we believe one more changed family can shape a generation and you have a role to play and shaping a generation by the way that you impact the life of one more family. Now we're gonna get to an uh, opportunity to watch together the story of uh, one of our teenage students here who, this is his story. He was far from God, but because of the hospitality here at Mountaintop, he found his way and it impacted his family. And as, he, as you watch it, I want you to just think about how could I be a part of a story like that? Yeah, there's something special going on. There's something special going on. There's, yeah. there's, there's life in the church. Uh, there's true life in the church up there. If you're, if you're able to pull all of these kids in, mm. 
that we're really questioning some things, there's something really happening up there that's pretty special. I grew up kind of in the church, but I always just had trouble like finding the want, like, and the, the personal desire to be at church. At a certain point, like, I kind of fell out of it. It was around the time, like, my grandfather had passed from cancer, and so I was thinking, like, what's, why? Like, what, that makes no sense. If there is a God, why is X, Y, Z happening? Like, it was, it was definitely kind of those kinds of thoughts. I remember it, you know, vividly when it, when we had the, the main conversation. I knew he had had some doubts. I knew he had, mm -hmm. he had been, you know, questioning some things, but we're sitting at the dinner table and just having a conversation. And it was very casual. It was very just kind of, you know, you know, I, I just, you know, I'm not sure I believe in God. I just kind of saw this like look on his face and, and he told me one thing that I'll never forget is that if this is the decision that you want to make, I will support you. Um, but this isn't obviously what I agree with. My parents encouraged me to do my own research and to, you know, not believe everything I hear and really go through and um, find out things for myself and what I truly believe. There was like a, a tragedy that ended up happening um, at, at Hoover, there was kind of like this change and throughout the high school and it, it really brought, you know, the, the students closer together. I mean, so there was like a couple of like, like events, like worship nights, and I got invited to one of them and I ended up going and um, I ended up giving my life to Christ that night. I ended up getting invited back here, coming in and, you know, having people greet me at the door and then, you know, everything with, with the gong, like even just funny things like that. So it, it felt like very, like oriented to newer people. And so it was definitely, I definitely felt accepted here, but when we went to Fall Retreat, I mean, it was it was like, I created a serious bond with some of those guys, like being in a, in a cabin with a lot of those guys for a couple nights and really spending all your time together, it, it really brought us close together. I was like, this, this is where I need to be. This is, this is the church where I need to be. It's never really, even felt like I was an outsider. Like from the second I showed up here, I mean, Josh, I mean, every, like Savannah, Matt, all like the small group leaders from with, even with Daniel and all them, it was more like, like I was just part of the group, even on my first time coming. It is inspiring to, to know that the church is committing and giving so much to the youth and so much uh, time and energy and effort. Um, it's been it's been great to see that he's uh, he's found that home. Braden, it is my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk a new life. Uncles and aunts and grandparents and all that from from all over came to watch me get baptized, and that was really a really special feeling. It's so cool to be able to, to see the change in my life, like the dramatic change from from attending no church a year ago today to now being on a leadership team, leading a small group, being a regular attendee here, you know. One of the coolest experiences I had was Zach, who's now the middle school um, middle school pastor. He came to me and said, I think you'd be great in this role. I want you to step in and take over, you know, this group of guys that I've been with. And so I'm, I'm pouring into them as much as I can. It's been cool to have my parents come to me and say, you know, we've seen this, this, this change. They have brought my child to God. That my child, my child now knows Christ through them. I mean, that to me is a gift I can't repay. The difference I felt from going through high school without Jesus versus with Jesus has been has been astronomically different. I'm getting chills just talking about it. Like it's it's just it's so cool um, to know that I wasn't given up on. Um, by, by family, by friends, and, and my spiritual life with Jesus, like just, I wasn't given up on.